for me, it's wonderful to be here. I mean, uh, Joe was my PhD student many years ago, and we kind of kept in touch, but didn't keep in touch, as you know. I mean, we just hardly, uh, we knew where we were, but we didn't talk much. And now, about 13 years after she finished, she comes back with this wonderful book, which I enjoyed enormously reading. So for me today, it's just an opportunity to ask Joe um, things about it. I mean, how did she come up with the idea? How did she write such a wonderful book? So um, let's keep it very informal. That's something else. If at any point uh, during the talk, someone has a pressing question, I think we both will be happy to interrupt our flow and chat about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I was going to say the same. It's such a pleasure to be chatting with you, Alex, after all of this time. Uh, it's been a long time since we were collaborating on anything. Um, but also I wanted to extend my thanks to Cathy um, for putting on this festival. It's such a fantastic festival um, and it's a real delight to be here. So as Alex said, it's going to be quite informal. Um, we don't have a script. We kind of have several points that we want to get across um, and things that we're, you know, we, we would like to talk about, but it will likely meander all over the place. That's kind of I think that's how it's going to go tonight with, with our discussion and especially if you guys ask questions, which we want you to do. So we do want it to be quite interactive as well, not just us talking to each other. We're going to have some questions that we ask you. So what we would like you to do is to get your phones and to go to www.menti.com. So that's at the top of the slide and just enter that code. So good to know at least that most people are aware of Aesop's fables and could name at least one of them. Um, and then we've got some other more mixed kind of feedback on the other questions. Right, Alex? 27 people already, so we have to assume that that is representative of the population we have here. I think so. It's interesting. It is, yeah. And so these are the sorts of points that we're going to be touching on this evening. Like, how do we think about how animals think and when animals are being intelligent? And that's kind of all woven around um, Aesop's fables. So does anyone need a, a minute more or shall I move on? I think I'll move on. So has that question... Yeah, so still using your phones, please. Well, Pug is the winner. Pug is absolutely the winner. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Because there are a lot more of the positive connotations yeah. with wolves coming up here. Yeah. We're not seeing big bad wolf, are we? We're not seeing bad or villainous. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to, to that. but. Um, the first question that comes up is, and it comes from me when I read it, I, I knew you as a scientist, as a young scientist, and then as, as a more advanced one. But, mm, what I never thought is of you connecting popular culture uh, with the science you knew. And this is what this book is about. It's mm -hmm. about picking on the way people perceive the world, particularly as instantiated in this wonderful collection of, of short stories, of fables. And then you connected it to the science. I mean, how did you come up with this idea of um, using this as an anchor, I guess, to... Mm. to yeah, science? science and stories don't always go together, do they? Um, for me, many years ago, before I even knew what science was, you know, I was, I was the animal nerd as a child. Um, and that was all tied up with stories. So I read a lot of animal stories. Um, I used to write. All the stories I wrote were involving animals too. Um, my mum still actually has a book that I, I started writing when I was about eight um, about the adventures of a very clever hamster, which yeah. was uh, interesting. motivated yeah. by my own interactions with my hamster at the time. Um, 
So, you know, from the earliest age, I think stories were really important to me. And, and once I got into science, it was going to be a zoology and, and animal behaviour that grabbed me. But I think mm -hmm. stories and culture have always still been really important alongside that. So, you know, once I finished my PhD, um, this, this study came out, which we're going to talk more about, which was the first study to actually scientifically evaluate an Aesop's fable. And that was a study on crows. And so coming from a crow PhD, I was keenly aware of this study, I suppose. And Why don't you read us the, the fable that started out with the crow? Sure. Okay, so this is the fable of the crow and the pitcher. Some of you may be familiar with. So a crow perishing with thirst saw a pitcher and hoping to find water flew to it with delight. When he reached it, he discovered to his grief that it contained so little water that he could not possibly get at it. He tried everything he could think of to reach the water, but all his efforts were in vain. At last he collected as many stones as he could carry and dropped them one by one with his beak into the pitcher until he brought the water within his reach and thus saved his life. So that's the fable. Yeah. And what is the reality? The reality? I'll have to exit from here. But as mentioned, this is the first fable to have been scientifically studied. And the people that did this were um, researchers at Cambridge University, and they were working with rooks. So rooks are another member of the corvid family. Um, they're the ones that you might see typically in big groups, um, foraging in ploughed fields, sort of plunging their beaks deep into the earth. Um, and so these researchers, Nathan Emery and Chris Bird, were interested to know whether rooks could replicate Aesop's fable. And so it's a transparent tube that's partly filled with water. There's a little grub which is tacked to a piece of cork and that's just bobbing at the surface of the water. It's clearly very interested. Starting there we to go. Try, isn't it? Yeah. So, what, what do you think is going on, Joe? Well, I was going to actually ask the audience what you think when you see this behaviour and when you hear the fable. You know, what word comes to mind? Does it look like um, intelligence, for example? So, maybe just raise your hands if if that comes across as intelligent behaviour to you. Yeah, so the, the, the question is basically, Aesop got it right, right, according to this, according to this judgment. So the, the story he describes as a fable and is effectively something that could have happened. So maybe he did see it. Is that what I you mean, think? Yeah, given that, that image um, of the crow in the picture, then perhaps it is something that he saw. So we could, we could I could have finished the chapter there and said, Aesop yeah. got it right. Um, what happened before? we see the animal doing this. Exactly. So that's, that's kind of one of the main themes or um, motivations for me to write the book, is to sort of say, you know, these things look very intuitive and, and media coverage of this experiment was all, really, it was all framed around this being a clever bird, this being, you know, the brainy crows um, solving Aesop's, Aesop's fable. But there's so much that we're not seeing from this and the reality can be so much more complicated. So, you know, for example, we don't actually know what experience that bird has already had before it came to this trial. You know, we don't know whether it 
tried it 100 times uh, and, yeah, you could and then train, got it right. We know if we've been to a circus, you know, at least in old fashioned circus, you could see a parrot riding a bicycle. And the question is, is it's been trained, it's been reinforced for that. Right. So maybe the animal has been actually rewarded for dropping things by giving it a little biscuit every time it drops something. And that's all we are seeing. Yeah, and, and in fact, in this experiment, the birds did receive that prior experience, didn't they? They were rewarded for dropping stones into tubes. And it wasn't on the same problem, but it was a different experiment. But they were still rewarded for dropping stones into tubes. Yeah. So you have to then think, you know, what, what are we actually able to conclude about their intelligence yeah. from, from that? I think the core of the problem is that we all feel, and we may be right, that we can judge whether a behaviour is intelligent or not. But if we were asked, first of all, what do we mean by something being intelligent? We are in trouble. Even scientists that spend all their lives working on it are in trouble defining what intelligence is. But second, to go from a behaviour to whatever it is our definition of intelligence takes a lot of experimental work, a lot of analysing how did the animal come to do this and is it just being a puppet that mm. is being shaped by human thinking. Mm. So there's a lot more complexity there, but we do know that other corvids have also done this problem. So New Caledonian crows um, have also shown the same behaviour and they weren't pre-trained, but it took them a few goes to actually get the hang of it. And then they learned very quickly. Yes, and Eurasian jays, um, I similarly. Guess Everything we do that we consider to be intelligent never comes out of just nothing. We have a history, we've learned to do similar things, and it's that extra step to do some connection extra that is what we actually suddenly say, oh gosh, this is really smart. Mm. And um, maybe this is a point to introduce what New Caledonian crows do. I don't know if you want to mention, because I should say, Joe's PhD was on a different species of corvid and was actually before that experiment working on some birds that live in an island in the middle of the Pacific. So it's a good excuse to choose an experimental animal. So you have to go to remote places. I didn't get to go. I, I did. Was the <laughs> <laughs> but um, these animals are special. These are a unique species in the sense that they, the first thing they do when they face a problem is to seek for a tool. And they, they may fail to solve it, they may pick up sometimes the wrong tool, but that's what they do. And on the, the story that we want to tell that is not in a fable that is represented here was when we once accidentally saw that very animal that you see there when she was alive, solve a problem that left us completely, I mean, jaw dropped. So we just couldn't believe what we were seeing. And mm. Joe has a film of it, doesn't Yeah. You? Should we just introduce Betty then? As... Well, maybe after the, okay. after the film. <laughs> I, I, yes, I'm having a way, but... So uh, here, you see that there is a little basket, you will see it when it's in bookment, at the bottom of the tube. And she has just a straight wire and is trying to get it out. And what she did next is what actually surprised us, no limit. And this is the actual tube, right? I mean, the, that is the actual is... tube and that's an actual hook made by her. Yeah. You'll see that in a minute. What she's doing is inserting the wire, jamming it in whatever she could, in this case, a crack in the tray. This was completely spontaneous and she hadn't been trained at all to do any of this. And you see, she bent the wire there. And she managed to do that. And so this was the, this was the beginning of a beautiful friendship, I should say. I mean, <laughs> when we saw that, um, we just tried to understand what was going on. And that led to about 10 years and several PhDs, of which one of the best was Joe's. 
And that is Betty. That's a very Betty with a very apparatus that um, that led to this observation. So I guess the thing that convinced us that there was something interesting going on is that she hadn't been trained to anything, and it was a spontaneous behavior, and she hadn't been exposed to wires in real life. But we learned later that they do make hooks in the wild. It's just that they don't make them by using that particular technique. Yeah. So there's a, there's a few questions that come up from that, right? The relationship between lab research and what we see in the field. Um, and also this question, which for me, I think is really interesting. And like, how important is a first trial performance and, and how much does that depend on what the trial actually is on because as you said yourself we, we all bring our experience to the way that we solve problems we we need to have learned certain things in order to have the competence to invent a new solution um, but on the other hand a first trial in, a first trial behavior is really really important so it seems to me like there's this yeah. important balance there in a we, sense we are unfair to animals because when we solve a problem, we face a new problem, we kind of fumble around, we try to do different things and eventually we solve it. Very rarely we see a problem and without any contact we just go and solve it. But with animals, if we actually allow the animal to try a little bit, people will say, oh, it's not an intelligent solution, it's just trial and error. And this is what we're trying to do. And so what we did with Betty in the course of a lot of research was to ask her to do different things and see whether she also could immediately respond to that. Not just Betty, many con specifics, but I'm just focusing on her. For example, we said, okay, she always bends something, but what if we give them something that is bent and because of being bent is too short? Would she be able to actually unbend it to make it long enough to actually reach something? And surprise, surprise, she did. And similarly, we gave them tools that were slightly uh, wonky or um, had some other failures and they would correct them. So when you have a battery of things like that, mm -hmm. you are convinced that actually Aesop was probably right, that crows are capable of this yeah. intelligent solution. And, you know, part of what I tried to do in the chapter um, on crows is to give a bit of a synthesis of COVID cognition, you know, across the family. So with New Caledonian crows, um, and I'd say with ravens, particularly good at physical problem solving as well. Um, it's these sorts of problems, like do they have any understanding about the kind of tools that they're using? Do they choose things um, correctly? Yeah. But then with some of the, the corvids, it seems like their intelligence is channeled more into the social domain. So it's it's more about their relationships with other birds. You know, are they capable of deceiving them? What do they know about, um, well, reconciliation or, or these sorts of things? But it does seem that across the whole family, corvids excel um, at problem yeah. solving. They do. It's, it's very difficult in animal behavior to separate what is a unique property of a species and what is due to the fact that that species has been studied more than others, so to control for the amount of effort. So we really don't know. But one thing that is interesting for the whole field, if I just look at it from a distance, is that 30 or 40 years ago, if you ask any specialist, people like us who have been dedicating their lives to study that, they would consider many of the things we know today impossible including tool use in so many species and problem solving of this nature and animals as uh, mathematicians. I mean, we now know how animals manipulate quantities and calculate averages to decide what to do next, all sorts of things like that. So 30 or 40 years ago, we knew very little. Now we, knew a lot of, we know a lot of facts, but we haven't progressed much in knowing how they do it. We have discovered lots of facts, but not lots of explanations. We are still struggling to actually say at what point there is a mental operation that allows this animal to actually reach these solutions. And that's something that Aesop seems to have gauged quite properly 
what is it, two and a half thousand years ago? Two and a half thousand, yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, I think maybe he did see, he must have seen if he was a real person. Well, there is yeah. some dispute about that. Well, but let's assume have, that yeah. he was a real person um, and he did see crows out in the wild doing things yeah. that, that seemed intelli intelligent. In a sense, it doesn't matter too much if he was a real person, does it? Because in reality, the kind of things that he attributes to animals are things that all of us would and the general people do. And so it's like it was popular knowledge that say foxes are cunning and wolves are packed. Wolves are packed. packed. Yeah. You know, wolves are <laughs> ferocious or whatever. So people can attribute that, but what it isn't present, what isn't available, is an explanation of how they actually achieve these things. What's the mixture of their genetics and their learning and their social inputs that allow them to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will do it how they... move to the next one. Talk about wolves, or I think we should probably move because I know that we could we could talk about crows probably all yeah. night, and um, we probably shouldn't. So yes, let's so want... let's move on yeah. to yeah. Um, the wolf. And you're going to read us the next. So it's the fable of the wolf in sheep's clothing. Once upon a time, a wolf resolved to disguise his appearance in order to secure food more easily. Encased in the skin of a sheep, he pastured with the flock, deceiving the shepherd by his costume. In the evening, he was shut up by the shepherd in the fold. The gate was closed and the entrance made thoroughly secure. But the shepherd, returning to the fold during the night to obtain meat for the next day, mistakenly caught the wolf instead of a sheep and killed him instantly. So... A wolf in sheep's So, clothes. I think there are a couple of different versions of that fable, actually. In some of them, the wolf doesn't get caught. The wolf gets away with, you know, cheating. Uh, some of them. Mm. The, the version that I decided to use, um, uh, cheaters don't yeah. prosper. Yes, out. the critical thing is the wolf is clever enough to disguise itself as a sheep. And yeah. do, we, do people here think just before we discuss it too much, that animals really can do that, that they can lie. And by this it means, I know I'm a wolf and I pretend to be a sheep, right? So lying is not just looking in a particular way. It means having some awareness of the impression you want to cause in someone else. Mm. Deception is a very complex, complex mm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are animals capable of it? What do people yeah. think? Yeah? Hands up if it's a yes. Yeah. 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 Same sort of and what's the evidence? People. So what do you think, Joe? Well, I think deception is such a broad term. I mean, essentially we're talking about information transfer between two organisms, right? I mean, one is communicating something and the other one is receiving it. But with deception, it's false. So the information that's being communicated isn't honest, right? So, but I think there are different levels of it. So at one end, you might have the most tightly controlled um, behaviors like um, woolly aphids who sort of disguise themselves, uh, lace wings, sorry, who disguise themselves in the wax of the woolly aphids, but they're not thinking about it. They're doing it because it's it's very tightly controlled. And at the other hand, you've got the kind of deception that we do as people, which allows us to, you know, cheat um, and to hustle and um, to really get one over on people because we're able to anticipate what other people know. We're able to anticipate their knowledge state and we're able to then predict what might be able to trick them. So I think there's kind of a whole spectrum. Yeah, but in what, there. what if I say that in some sense, all communication that anybody does is deceptive? Because whenever you communicate anything, what you're doing is you're trying to make the other one do something which is convenient for you on the basis of the information you are passing, particularly in other species, but also with us. I mean, whenever we tell something, we are manipulating the behavior of the receiver. So in what sense is, for example, um, 
say, a, a male bird that is singing to convince females that he is the, the best one in the, in the woodland, lying more or less than, than the wolf. So what is special about deception? To say, it's not just that all communication is like that, but mm. deception is special and only a few animals can do it. Well, lots of animals show tactical deception of a form, I think. Whether that's something like a lapwing that does its amazing broken wing display um, when it sees a predator, you know, to try and get them away from its nest. I think that's very different to what uh, Aesop's wolf was doing, which was more of an intentional deception. So I think there might be a difference between oh. these kind of tactics, these tactical um, deception yeah. examples can, and can intentional. Can one deceive oneself? <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> um, I'd say I think this you because can think you yeah. can. I don't know. Self-deception is a very popular uh, concept, and actually is popular also among biologists because there are some very famous biologists who have actually written about it, convinced that self-deception is important and useful. For example, when animals are going to fight, and they convince themselves that they have greater fighting ability than they objectively have, so that they will actually go for it. Right? This is what Bob Trivers has been postulating as well. And I, I'm very skeptical about it, about the concept overall. But um, what, what do you think? Well, I'd like to think back to the wolves a little. Um, I, don't know that there's, I don't know that we can ever know, though, about self-deception, um, even if we could in our own species. Mm whether we could ever have any idea if, if other animals can do it. But to me, that I don't know that we have good enough evidence for other animals being capable of the sorts of sophisticated, mind-reading tactics that allow us to deceive others, let alone you know, yes, the ability to, yeah. to, to then have the ability to, to do it for themselves. I guess the critical but, thing that you do bring up, uh, interestingly, cleverly in the book, is that you use the word intentionally. So you have to deceive, you have to convey different information that you know not to be true. If I tell you that it's going to rain tomorrow and it doesn't rain, but I strongly believed that it was going to rain tomorrow, I'm not lying to you, even though I'm telling an untruth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So politicians are very frequently uh, guarding themselves by saying, of course I said something that wasn't true, but I wasn't aware that it was yeah. true. Though, so that was why I said it. So I wasn't lying. And what we are asking here is whether Aesop was right in thinking that wolves might be able to tactically pretend something that they are not. Yeah, yeah. And to to then have in their minds that they know that the person, the, the thing that they're deceiving has false knowledge about that situation. Yeah. And, and these false beliefs, that's something that develops in children at around the age of four years, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's the ability to, to, as Alex said, basically know that someone else can know something about the world. So, so that's theory of mind. So maybe go back a step. Yeah. Theory of mind, being able to look at someone or talk to someone and kind of have an idea of what's going on in their mind. So you can, Keep in, keep in mind both your own thoughts and desires and, and beliefs, but also those of other people. So that's kind of controversial on its own as to whether other animals have that ability. But then false beliefs, that's kind of um, the most sophisticated stuff, I would say, being able to represent in your mind that someone else might not just know something and believe something, but that it might actually not be true. And so that's kind of the crux of this, isn't it? Yeah. And there's no evidence at all that wolves can do this. So, you know, a lot of research has been done with wolves, lots of it in the, in the wild, some really long running studies in say the US and Canada, um, where they look at natural behavior and they've found out some fantastic things about how wolves work together in their packs and the sort of social relationships that they have. And then there more recently have been a lot of um, studies on captive wolves 
uh, and mostly these are done compared with dogs um, to try and get an idea of how wolves solve problems and how this might differ um, or be similar to, to the way that dogs do it. I know, I mean, they don't, but I know that you have some videos of wolves and dogs. Why don't you show them? I do. So I think the first thing to say, well, this is a video about cooperation rather than deception. So as I said, there's no evidence, as far as we know, that wolves are capable of deception, but they're very good at cooperating with each other, as you would expect for a pack animal that needs to work together to take down big prey. So in this test, both of these wolves, so they are wolves, they've been hand reared at this facility in Vienna. I'll just pause that actually to explain. Um, so dogs and wolves are both reared under the same conditions. Uh, at this place, it's the Wolf Science Center um, outside Vienna. And they're both reared um, you know, identically so that there's no possibility of saying, well, the dogs grew up in a slightly different way and that's what's um, causing them to behave differently. And in this particular test, so there's some meat, it's on a platform, and there's a, a rope threaded around this platform. And in order for the dogs to get the meat, both of the animals have to pull at the same time. If they don't pull at the same time, then the rope just kind of gets pulled out. So it's completely ineffective. They have to pull together. So this is a classic test of cooperative ability across the animal kingdom. Um, it's been done in lots and lots of different species. So you saw that the, the wolves do it very nicely. These are the dogs. <laughs> and you thought your dog was clever. <laughs> well, the, and the other one just wanders off in the end. <laughs> So, and then in this test, this, these are wolves again, but this is the really crucial test. This is saying, are they actually aware that they both need to pull together? Or is it just that they both end up getting there at the same time and then they both pull? So it, it's, are they actually coordinating their behavior um, or just happening to, to do it at the same time? So yes, it's the answer for wolves. So it's quite interesting because it's the wolves which are cooperative and it's the dogs which are actually are, each one is monopolizing the, the, the access to the food. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, does that fit with kind of your preconceptions of wolf and, wolf and dog behavior? Is that, that's what you'd expect or, yeah? yeah? Dogs, um, so people know about wolves. Seem to be, probably heard yeah. speaking about them. Yeah. <laughs> but it does seem that there's a difference. But, you know, could we say that wolves are generally more intelligent than dogs? I, I don't think so. They clearly have very, very different forms of intelligence, right? I mean... Yeah. The problem is that behaviour is as easy to select for as it is the morphology of an animal. And dogs have been selected for many years, many generations, to cooperate with people. So when they have a problem, what they do is look at people yeah. and hope for that that's going to solve their problem, which normally happens, right? If you want your leash to be taken to the, to the park, then you look at your mm -hmm. owner and, and that's going to happen. And, and yep. wolves don't have that. No, so they have to do. wolves just use sheer persistence, I think. Um, they just try every trick in the book. So if you set them an impossible task, they will just use brute force and they will bite at it and they will do everything they can to try yeah. and solve it. And then absolutely, when the same thing is given to a dog, I think yeah. it just looks up and... There was a very amusing solved. experiment that um, Clive Wynn, a, a colleague of ours, did with trying to see differences between dogs and wolves which was extremely simple, one of the simplest experiments you could think of, which was basically to have a person unknown and familiar to the animals sitting in a place within a square meter 
of ground and just letting either a, a, a tame wolf or a dog come in and counting what proportion of the time the animal spent within the, the square meter around the person. And the results were very funny. It was uh, for dogs, it was 100% of the time, and for wolves, it was zero. And so <laughs> he complained, this man, that he couldn't do any statistics with those numbers <laughs> because they were very extreme. Yeah. But I mean, wolves, wolves still will cooperate with people. Um, I think the, the research shows that both dogs and wolves cooperate very well with, with humans when they've been reared in that environment. Um, but they do it quite differently. So dogs are generally very deferential towards the, uh, the humans. They tend to wait for the human to make the first move. Wolves, on the other hand, they just come in and they get on with it and, and they almost take the lead really they see the human as a cooperative partner but but not in this sort of deferential yeah. way yeah i guess the one thing that we keep trying to do with all the animals we study is that we know that there are basically only three ways in which animals know how to do things one is because they have it in their genes and the other is because they try different things and they repeat what works. And the third one is what we call intelligence, which is actually representing the problem and elaborating and finding a solution. And what we are trying to do all our time is to make this last thing smaller and smaller by trying to understand what are the components that an animal brings genetically and has acquired by experience. In the case of wolves this is and dogs, this is quite interesting because they have been reared similarly, so that somehow it's controlled for the different experience that most dogs and wolves have. Mm -hmm. And he's telling us they bring different propensities yeah. because they've been selected for it already. Yeah, there's also some striking similarities, I suppose, but, but really interesting to see those differences mm. in, in the way that they solve yeah. problems. Um, and so thinking about wolves, I mean, actually, your great audience because that word cloud showed that you don't think about wolves um, in the sort of stereotypical way that, uh, yeah, do you have a question? Sorry. Well, there's a comment here. So you would have made a distinction there between intelligence, which is genetic, so it talks about perception, which would be like camouflage and all of that, and uh, intelligence, which is based on experience, and then another intelligence. So if we think about the comeback of wolves in in Europe, particularly in, uh, in Holland and uh, in Germany, those wolf packs which have come in, they have no experience of living in those human-dominated landscapes because they've just moved in, mm. and they're not genetically predisposed to it. So, but they've really, they have incredible, sorry, they have the ability to live incredibly discreetly. Nobody knows they're there in a totally unnatural for them. Is that intelligence then? How, how, how do they sussed out how to do that? Well, Because nobody, I mean, they could have come in and been like a dog and everybody had seen them and got totally freaked out, but they've just sneaked in. Mm. Is that intelligence yeah. or, or what, what's that? I would say that's mainly more instinctive, well, right? I mean, what I would say is that we never know. So we can study. <laughs> so I, I, I agree with the, the nature of the, the fact that you're kind of puzzled about it and you're asking us and I, I wouldn't give an answer to that but the only thing I disagree with you is when you say that these animals don't have experience of living with humans they don't come out of nothing either they've been introduced in some places and then they've been reared under some conditions or they were residual populations that are expanding now and the reason they are expanding is that they are actually adjusted to living in the, in the gaps that human populations leave. For example, in Germany that you mentioned, one thing that is happening is that there is a big proliferation of wild boar. And so there is suddenly a source of food. Within 20 kilometers of the center of Berlin, there are now packs of wolves, very small packs. But they are there because humans have led to the proliferation of wild boar, which now becomes food 
for the wolves. So in everything every animal does, intelligence and experience, including us, intelligence and experience are, are very deeply intertwined and we can't really easily separate. But what we can do is try to reduce the specific information acquired by experience to see what the animals can solve in a novel problem. I don't know if that answers your not, not really, no, because you just made the distinction between instinct and intelligence. So, with respect, I know quite a bit about these wolves, and a lot of them walk thousands of miles into these places, or they did. So, is that just like me going travelling somewhere, and my instinct when I'm, you know, travelling through India or whatever, is, you know, to live normally? That's not intelligence, that's just my instinct. Is that the same thing? So, what's the difference between instinct and intelligence here? So when I was when I, I mentioned said I use my instincts probably instinct, yeah. um, I was also thinking about the evolutionary history of wolves with humans. I mean, they've been so very persecuted um, for being predators of, of livestock and and all of this. Um, so that potentially we know that dogs evolved from a wolf ancestor um, and were selected for their friendly traits and their boldness. But a lot of the wolves that uh, were aggressive or, uh, you know, they would have been killed, basically. By, so, I oh, mean, they are I'm, being killed today. Yeah. So potentially we're seeing wolves left who, who do have that e extra fear response yeah. to, to humans. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. But th there is... Talking about the DNA aspects of it. Yeah. I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking about the, the yeah. genetic kind of component, but we, I mean, as Alex says, we have to do also remember that that interacts with, with their environment, yeah. and that's kind of how it produces behaviour. It, it's important to try to understand that when we talk about what is inherited, what we mean is differences. What we are asking, there is no behaviour that is purely coded in the genes or purely acquired. So... In all behaviours, there is an inter, particularly in complex animals, everything is intertwined, including in us. But what we could say is when you have two species or two populations or two individuals and they differ in what they do, we could ask what fraction of their differences is attributable to different experience and to different genetic background. And what is trying to be done in this case, for example, in this research, is exposing members of two species to, if we can, as similar as possible, the same environment. And this is not possible even with identical twins, because each one of them has a slightly different experience by just being one member of the pair. But still, you could ask, if they are identical in terms of their genes, any difference I see must be caused by their experience. And normally, that's not the case. You don't have this extreme difference. But maybe we have to move on a little bit because uh, I don't know if you want to carry on this. There is... Let's move on then to... Yeah. Okay. Uh, and there is a fable that wasn't in your book that I was interested in, which was yes. the one of the... the you, you have it there, the don't you? And I, I like to share that because this thing I'm going to show you is an observation which is not published, but it's extremely puzzling by us that we, we found it um, in the field, and I want to share it with you now. This is the, the fable. This is one of those that escaped from Joe's uh, survey. So there we go. So, because you've, um, yeah. you've come along to this, you get a, a fable for free. So you know, let me read it to you. Or, or Yes, I'll read it. A farmer who bore a grudge against a fox for robbing his poultry yard caught him at last, and being determined to take an ample revenge, tied some rope well soaked in oil to his tail and set it on fire. The fox, by a strange fatality, rushed to the fields of the farmer who had captured him. It was the time of the wheat harvest, but the farmer reaped nothing that year and returned home grieving sorely. So, the moral of this story is that revenge is futile, right? That actually, once the damage has been done, it's equivalent, you could think of road traffic, 
for this. So once you, if you're driving in a, in a motorway and someone does a um, very dangerous operation, the last thing you want to do is to say, oh, I'm going to pay him back and just chase it and do something dangerous again. You just let him go. It's stupid and it's been damaging. And here with the fox, the poultry was, were already dead and the farmer, instead of letting the fox go and do whatever, at least have his harvest, goes into um, this revenge mode. So we don't expect revenge to happen in nature. We don't expect, maybe you can add just one. So once the poultry were gone, the harm has been done, then we don't expect animals to fall for something like revenge, because in a sense, animals, if I can say that way, are too stupid to be that stupid. So they, they won't actually, we think, do anything which is maladaptive just because of getting their own back. Right. And this is where the empirical observation comes into that I want to tell you. Yeah, this, this, is, story. this is really interesting research and um, so just going to whiz we through We work in, in South America. We work on these animals. The, those in the left are the shiny cowbirds and they are parasites of mockingbirds. When I mean parasites, it's a bit like you may be familiar with a cuckoo, that what they do is they lay their eggs in the nests of mockingbirds, right? And so they let all the, the rearing to the mockingbird. If you go quickly through those three movies, it shows what the cowbirds do. This is a mockingbird nest, and this is a cowbird. It comes and breaks the eggs it finds during daytime, and then it just goes away. And then the next one, the next day, before sunrise, it comes back to the nest and then lays her own egg. And once it does that, the mockingbird doesn't recognize the extra egg. And here you see the, the little one is a cowbird and the two big ones are mockingbird chicks. So a few weeks later, the cowbird is living in the nest with them. So that's the basic natural history and there's lots of work on this. But in the next slide, I'll show you what I was surprised about. If you see an unattended mockingbird nest, what happens is that cowbirds arrive, break the eggs as you saw before, and then very often the mockingbird finds them and beat them up very, very seriously. And mobbing impedes the cowbird from breaking the eggs, but doesn't impede them from laying. So you see a little blue egg there, which has been laid by the cowbird. And when the cowbird escapes, the mockingbird chases it. And that's what is interesting, because when the mockingbird keeps moving the cowbird away from the nest, other cowbirds come and use the opportunity to lay their own eggs. So here, the mockingbird is behaving like a farmer, right? What he's doing is chasing someone that has hurt them for no benefit whatsoever. This is what we call strong reciprocity. That is, you return a social act even when there's no advantage to do that, right? And so people do that, we know. There is a little movie that if you go quickly through this, that's the problem I described. And here you see a cowbird come into a nest and the mockingbird has found it and is beating it very harshly, but in a minute, the cowbird tries to escape. You will see that in a minute. It's very persistent, the cowbird, isn't Sorry? it? The cowbird, oh, it, it yes. doesn't give up. The cowbird won't go until she lays. It's, fe it's a female, of course. Even though she is being yeah. battered. Oh, yes. And sometimes I get killed. You see an extra egg now. Yeah. And the cowbird is being retained by the mockingbird. And in doing that, the nest is exposed, right? So instead of protecting the nest, it's actually hitting an animal that has already done its harm. And now another cowbird comes and uses the opportunity to do it. So the mockingbird is paying a big price 
for another actually six eggs. And there's another egg so you can stop it here <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So i mean this on. video does go on and another one comes in and they end up with seven yes. eggs which is yeah. kind of amazing um so they started with four eggs yeah so you see here is extremely complicated because the only kind of explanation we have for this sort of thing is that the mockingbird, I'm going to be now completely anthropomorphic and just to come clean, and this is because we don't understand what's going on, right? So when you don't, you use anthropomorphic language. So it's like if the mockingbird is angry because the cowbird has inflicted some cost and is getting its own back, even at a price, and that's what humans do, but animals shouldn't be doing that. Right? And so we have worked through, uh, there is no time today, but we are still working through a number of seven or eight different hypotheses, trying to think what could make that behavior adaptive. But in some sense, Aesop was right again. <coughs> Animals mm. may be able to develop a sense of anger that makes them be violent when it's convenient, and sometimes it spills over and then you are um, violent when it's actually costly to you. Yeah. So we so have to be prepared for that. It makes sense to be violent when when you get ahead. Um, so selection would would sort of favour um, getting angry. Uh, yeah. In this know. case. But in this case, yeah. it's it's just spilled over into something that's completely yeah. non. It does because beneficial. it is um, useful to be violent before the cowbird has broken eggs because being violent then stops the cowbirds from breaking an egg but once it's laid an egg and is living i should say that the cowbird will never come back to a nest in which it has done it because it doesn't want to attack its own egg right so they are clever enough to remember that so this is one yeah. case we we don't yet understand and is part of our current research we talked a little bit, well, we, you introduced that fable with a bit of fox. So maybe we can finish with a little bit of fox because... Um... Yeah. Sorry, could you speak? Could you speak a bit? Oh, was there another mockingbird? Was there another mo mockingbird in that clip that you were showing? I yes. There was. I, yeah. I, I should say this observation has been repeated uh, I wouldn't say hundreds, but certain several dozen times. So it's not uh, an isolated anecdote. It's we have quantified to the extent that we can what is the cost of mockingbirds of doing this kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot to talk about it, but yes, there are other cowbirds coming around. And cowbirds are attracted to the hullabaloo of, um, um, of this battle going on because it's in the dark, and when they see that, then they, are a, they know that there's a vulnerable nest there, and they do it. So it's quite puzzling. That's the reason I shared it. Okay. Yes, you wanted... I want to just share this image with you. It's not a very good image, but um, it's... Uh, it's one that I took, and, and it's one that kind of sparked my motivation to write about foxes. So one of the chapters that I wrote about is, um, is the fable of the, the fox and the crows. Um, but really, I just wanted to use it as a way of exploring what we know about fox behavior. Um, because these, you know, the fox is so synonymous with terms like crafty and cunning and sly and wily and you know I don't really know what those terms mean when they're applied to animals anyway but um, they, they sort of go together so much so I wanted to to do a little bit of, of research into what um, foxes are actually like and like I say it was it was motivated by this image and I'm just going to read you um, the start of the chapter where it sort of explains a little bit more I discovered foxes on the 9th of January 2018. I'm a grown woman, so I know that sounds odd, because foxes are everywhere and everyone knows about them. What I mean is that on that January morning, I first noticed foxes. 
my partner John had bought me a camera trap and I eagerly set it up night after night in our suburban Oxford garden, waking each day with the excited anticipation of a child on Christmas morning. Several cat's bums and a soggy mouse later, there was a tantalising <coughs> glimpse of fox. It was a dark, underexposed photo, I was still learning, showing a delicately poised back leg and tail, but it was unmistakable. That telltale bushy brush we first learn about as children, snapped by my camera at 3.25 a.m. that frosty winter night. And the foxes uh, that have visited my garden, and I know it's the same for you, bring a lot of joy, I think. Um, so there's a few little clips of some of the fox behaviour that, um, that I caught on my camera traps. But Oxford has such a strong heritage in, in fox research. Oh, yeah. I mean, going back to David MacDonald's first pioneering work in what, late 70s or, or 80s, yeah. potentially. Um, mid 70s. Mid 70s. Yeah. That's yeah. when I arrived and he was working on it. Right. And the, the foxes have been studied there at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, you know, long term studies for, <laughs> for several decades. I mean, who. Who else in the audience has sort of the similar experiences or encounters? Do, does anyone else have foxes that regularly visit their gardens? A couple of people, a few people. And, and do you like them? Do you like to see them? Does anyone, I mean, if you, again, if we did that word cloud, what would be like the first word that you would um, come up with? for a fox, would it be something like crafty or cunning or would it be scrawny. pest? Scrawny. <laughs> <laughs> so Urban foxes do look a little bit scrawny. <laughs> Playful. Um, Inquisitive. Yeah, they absolutely are. And I would say, Conservative. sorry? Conservative. Conservative. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Sorry, it was a little bit slow <laughs> up to mark there. Um, I've got it. So we all kind of do know about foxes. Um, and I'll just turn those off. They certainly have a place in, in our cultures, don't, don't they, and in our popular stories. Um, you know, the fox is generally always portrayed in this, this same way, but we don't actually know a lot about their intelligence we don't have the research. So there's all of this, I guess, stuff in the world around us. We can see them doing things that look clever, but when it comes to actually learning about how they're yeah. solving problems, we, the studies how, haven't been yeah. done. How plausible do you think it is that a fox, like in a fable, would actually trick a crow into dropping its piece of cheese so that he can eat it? Right, I want to hear your voice yeah. when you sing. Again, or they're coming, we're coming back to deception, aren't we? We're coming back to that yeah. topic of does the fox, would the fox be able to represent the mental state of another animal? Yeah. And, and there's no evidence yeah. that they could do that within yeah. their species, yeah. but even, even less so for across species. We know that monkeys do it, vervet monkeys, we know that um, apes do it. So we simply don't know about, this is what we said at the beginning, where you confound a research effort with evidence. So mm. we have no evidence that foxes can actually intentionally deceive a member of another species or a member of their own species. And we do know that for primates. We know that, that monkeys can actually shout leopard when they want, when actually there is no leopard, but they want their other monkeys to run into cover so that they can actually um, collect some food or something like that. So there are a number of examples of that nature. Mm. But with foxes, we don't know yet. And so yeah. it's out there to be done. Yeah, yeah. So the field of uh, comparative cognition has, has broadened hugely. I mean, from yeah. being very, very primate focused. Yeah. Um, and well, I hope people yeah. go out with the idea. I was trying to say that at the beginning, and I, I think we agree that we keep discovering facts. Our uh, description of the natural world has become much, much richer 
in recent years and continues to grow very fast, particularly because new techniques are discovered for how to track animals and film them in the dark and things of that sort. But what is still very hard is to in understand how their cognition operates, what kind of operations they do in order to reach the solutions that they do reach. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope your book, if this is a way to kind of round it up, actually serves to convince people that there is a room for, there is room for relating popular visions of animals to the scientific research of what they do and trying to see how much of it goes together and how much does not. Yeah, I hope so too. That's, um, that is kind of my aim and yeah, um, yeah we will see. Is this a good time but, to wrap up? Uh, how are we doing on time? Is this... We can so, show, I mean we, we obviously have yes, more things we, we could show. Yes. It would also be nice if there are more people who haven't spoken yet and if they want to ask questions and, or, or argue with us. Hello. Like that. We have one question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for amazing talk and discussion. I just wanted to ask um, uh, many questions about um, semiotics or biosemiotics even or like philosophy of mind or whatever popped up during this evening and i wanted to ask uh of course i would know if i read your book but i haven't so i want to ask um have you tackled those questions in the book uh like about definitions of the words like intelligence uh definitions of whatever the topic you discuss uh like do you use the some some kind of folk um folk understanding of those words uh or like do you um you know did you study maybe some experimental philosophical papers which uh, try to find out how people understand the words like intelligence etc etc mm -hmm. yeah so i i have summarized and um i've tried to sort of synthesize the definitions and the the ways that people have thought about um, things like intelligence and, and in various chapters. So there's a chapter that tackles deception, which we've talked about. Um, we haven't been able to go through all the chapters. There's a chapter that, that talks about social learning and imitation and, and, and definitions of what we mean by that um, and altruism. Um, but yes, when it comes to intelligence, I, I have tried to do my best to summarize what we mean but uh, as we've talked about it's you know this is a, a topic that could take an entire uh not even book yeah. book series i mean it's been it's it's still so hotly debated and um i mean alex is is working on intelligence um yeah, at the moment and, and still the team that he's working with don't yet have a a good definition of intelligence i think that's right yeah there, there is a trap that scientists including us, very often fall into, and I think Joe hasn't. And this is to pick up words from everyday language and define them operationally, which means define them properly in a way that you can test it, and then study the operational definition you've given. But then your research doesn't contact anymore with the intuition that people have or what it means. And intelligence, like emotion, like things like that, have such a um, strong basis on people's intuitive um, use of the word, that if you define it in a narrow, testable way, you're going to be rigorous, but you're not going to address the general concept anymore. And I don't think it's productive, particularly in a book as this one, which aims to establish a bridge between popular understanding and science, to, to kind of use the straitjacket of an operational definition. It's rather, we kind of know intelligence when we see it, but then we get it wrong. And I think that's what, what the book tries to do. So it tells you, this gives you that feeling but there is this, and on the other side there is that, sort of, obviously the fables are an excuse 
a, a very imaginative excuse. In a sense, I wonder why nobody thought of it before, to actually bring these popular conceptions of uh, intuitions of what animals are capable of, you know, and, and then use it to introduce more narrow concepts of what we already know. The question about the chapter on, on ants, the ants and the grasshopper, mm -hmm. which we haven't discussed, mm -hmm. is very appropriate for that, isn't it? Because, yeah. I, I, well, people haven't read it here. I, do, you, do you want to go into that or, or are we, it's going to take longer? I think by if the there book. are more questions. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Um, I was wondering if uh, when animals teach each other, is that intentional? Is that a sign of intelligence or is that instinct? You talked about social learning, but mm -hmm. is there any evidence that they deliberately teach each other things? Funnily enough, mm -hmm. I just had a magazine article published on teaching in um, BBC Wildlife a couple of, a couple of issues ago. Um, teaching is one of those things that I think people either think all animals do it or they think of it as something that's very very intelligent and um, sophisticated and so probably it's only humans and the reality is that certain animals do it it's quite rare but it's not an indicator of intelligence in those species so the first animals that showed conclusive proof of teaching and we have to distinguish what we mean by teaching it has to fulfill a couple of criteria um, you know it has to be directed towards behavior that's directed towards another animal. It has to be um, something that, that's costly for the teacher. So it can't just be, for example, a parent doing something which would ultimately be, be work out beneficial. Um, and it has to lead to a change in the pupil's behavior. So the first species that showed conclusive evidence of this was a species of ant. And, you know, that shocked the scientific world because there were a lot of people going, you know, we're looking for it in chimpanzees and then it comes in in a little species of ant and we now know that meerkats teach um, and some some species of bird and some others but um it's still pretty rare in the animal kingdom isn't it yeah once again we have an intuition of what we mean by teaching and uh, for example it's uh, as joe has said i mean it's there are many observations of animals learning from other animals but that's, complete, that's completely different from the, 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 the skilled animal actually going out of its way to pass the knowledge. And even in mother-child relations, in mother-offspring relations in chimpanzees, you see sometimes the offspring watching carefully what the mother does and learning, but you don't see any effortful behavior on the part of the mother to actually show the offspring what it does. But in other cases, like teaching migration routes, or in the case of ants, driving a partner, uh, a member of the colony to food, uh, animals do it. But then, of course, they are selected to share information. They are members of a colony. And it's not quite right that the first ant pays a cost because she is a worker only breeds through the behavior of the whole colony yeah so biologically people can i can argue i would argue myself that it's a real example of teaching in the sense that the teacher pays a cost in passing the information rather than benefiting itself ultimately genetically ultimately it's yes the the behavior of leading another ant is costly because it's much yes. slower. Yes. It takes that ant it's, it's longer. Costly it's, the, it's costly in that sense. Yeah. At the individual level, it's costly, but an individual ant is nothing. <laughs> and when an ant only makes sense in the context of a colony because it doesn't breed as, as an individual. So it's complicated. Does that help? Good. So what they're teaching is um, prey handling behaviour. So meerkats eat um, scorpions um, and being able to process scorpions is something that needs to be learned. 
So a baby meerkat can't just go and uh, tackle a scorpion. It probably will get stung and, and die. Um, so what the, the, the parents, but also the grown-up um, helpers, because meerkats are the cooperative breeders, so they have other helpers in their groups. Um, what they do is, is basically provision them with, with age-appropriate food. So they might start by providing a dead scorpion. Um, and then as the pups get older and a bit more competent, they might then um, dis, uh, sort of stop yeah. the, the stinger from stinging. But would understand to find the social rules be just by a, quick, by a process of, you know, what you were saying, watching, for example, stand on the lookout, you know, the, the, or signalling or sounds, those would all, um, particularly what, I don't know what words I could use, instinctively. Yeah, or, why not? Or, for want of a better word, just, you know, you, you watch what someone else does and you imitate or you, you instinctively just do these things. I or mean, they I, talk as well. There's the no... Sort of messaging or the, the, the actual uh, protection, the protective role that some of them take on in terms of... Yeah, it's, mm. it's a good question because they do have um, a, a very complex sort of society and take on these different roles and... Um, probably going to be a similar answer that we we don't yet know so teaching's only been established in that context of prey handling yeah. behavior um but but you talked about other forms of social learning and undoubtedly they're learning um from each other but there are lots of different levels of social learning so imitation is is one but actually something like in we call it enhancement where it could just be you know, I'm, I'm touching this and that draws your attention to it and, and an individual then explores it because their attention's being drawn to it. So, so that's another powerful way that individuals learn from each other, which, which doesn't actually involve any kind of more complex no. um, cognition. There, there are some nice examples of animals doing things which clearly are aimed at the development of their offspring and trying and these kind of things. I remember one some of the work that Nick Davies did many, many years ago on flycatchers, when the, the young are still in the nest, the parent flycatcher comes with food, and just when they are about to fledge, it would actually stop a few meters from the nest, sometimes dangling the worm, so that for, to force the young that want to be fed to come out of the nest. And there is a, a kind of manipulation there when they actually will be reluctant to come to the nest and do it. But then the offspring come out and if you watch them trying to forage when the parents are around, they are extremely clumsy. They, they just don't know, they drop their worms and things like that. And when the parents are away, they are quite good at it and they just can forage. So the parent is manipulating the offspring into trying to do things by itself, the offspring is manipulating the parent into still come and feed me, so I'm too unable to do it by myself. So this kind of dynamics we see very often, but none of them implies that the individual is thinking the strategy by itself. They're just designed to want to do that, and that's what they do. Well, thank you very much. I hope. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this has been um, it's fantastic. Been